Hello. In this video, I'll provide a basic background on the study of personality. I'll also review the big five factor theory of personality and the behavioral perspective on personality, where I'll review theories including classical and operant conditioning, and we'll consider how we can apply these theories to understand personality development. This is one of several reviews on personality, so I'd encourage you to take a look at the future videos on personality that you'll find in the links below. Let's first look at what personality is. Personality can be described as an individual's unique constellation of consistent behavioral traits. What's a trait? That's a durable disposition to behave in a particular way in a variety of situations. The word personality comes from the Latin word persona, and this referred to these masks that were worn by stage actors. Why do we want to understand our own personality and the traits of others? Part of this might be explained by our desire to be able to predict behavior. What information do you use to predict the behavior of others? Is the information that you use biased? Do you think that your expectations that you have for other people affect how you treat them and then how they behave? How do you think this interactive nature between what we expect from others or perhaps what your parents expected you to be like, affect how we treat others or how our parents treat us, and then how others behave and how we behave. How does this then affect our personality? When you're introduced to another person, do you look at their body language, their outward appearance? Have you ever looked at their social media pages later on? Perhaps you have a friend, maybe an acquaintance, and they've added you as a friend and you start to look at some of their pictures on social media. Do you ever use that to look at or kind of gauge what that person's like? Does it give you any information or is that just that mask like we just looked at? Do you look at past behavior? Is that a, does that allow us to predict future behavior? If you've been to their home, do you look at how clean their home is or the decorations that they have? Do you ever look at their body shape? That sounds like a strange one, but we're going to be looking at an older theory or approach to thinking about personality that involved actually looking at someone's body shape. Do you look at someone's facial expressions or how emotionally expressive they are? Does that give you any information? So what information do you use and why are you using that information? Does it lead you to the right conclusions or is it full of bias? and does it lead you down the wrong path? You probably have some kind of interest in learning about yourself and others, including your strengths or the strengths of other people. You might wanna know more about your own weaknesses and traits or those of others that you care about. But did you know that many of today's theories and even personality tests were influenced to some degree by one theory that proposed that our personalities are formed by our bodily fluids. So this was known in, pre in our, it is known in our present day as the four humors or what was called then the four temperaments. And this was a theory that later influenced everything from the creation of the Myers-Briggs type indicator test. And some of you have taken that test to the Kiersey temperament sorter. And these are personality tests that are used today. 
So specifically, these humors were black bile, which was associated with a melancholic personality, yellow bile being associated with a choleric personality, and blood, which was associated with a sanguine person, and phlegm is someone who's phlegmatic. It was thought that an imbalance of any of these bodily humors could affect our mental state and our physical state. So probably many of you have heard of bloodletting that was done in the Middle Ages, and this was actually performed by barbers. And um, this actually explains the traditional barber's pole where red is for blood and white represented the tourniquet. And the pole was a representation of the stick that the patient squeezed to dilate his veins. That's an interesting new piece of information that maybe some of you did not know. Sometimes people would use leeches and actually today, uh, scientists do know that leeches create or secrete some substances in their saliva that are anti-inflammatory, and so they are used in some treatments. But what are these traits that we're talking about, being sanguine, choleric, melancholic, or phlegmatic? So if you had an imbalance of blood, then this may affect your traits of being cur courageous or hopeful. So you might lack courage or lack hope or not want to be affectionate with other people. If you had an imbalance of bile, this might affect your temper. It might cause you to be easily angered or bad tempered. If you had an imbalance of black bile, this might encourage you to be um, irritable, and it might lead even to some sleeplessness. And then if you had too much phlegm or too little phlegm, this might cause you to be unemotional or overly emotional. So this is an early interesting approach to thinking about the traits that we have. And really what you're seeing here is a connection between our biology and traits. Now this is obviously not supported by research. There's not a connection between these bodily fluids and traits, but we start to see the history here of what we call the trait approach that we'll be looking at in this module. And here are those body types that are associated with different personality traits. So somebody who would be an endomorph, they would be relaxed, sociable, tolerant, comfort loving and peaceful. A mesomorph, uh, that person's going to be active, assertive, vigorous, and combative. And then an ectomorph is going to be someone who's quiet, fragile, restrained, non-assertive, and sensitive. So while we know that these physical traits or physical features don't connect to our personality, again, we're seeing still that underlying theme, that connection between our biology and our traits, which we do know that our biological predispositions like our genetics do play a very important role in affecting our personality traits. And we'll be looking at that this semester as well, or in, in this module actually, and later in the semester too. There are five major approaches that can be used to understand personality. We can think about who we are and how we become who we are through the lens of learning. So what role has learning played? So think about yourself. What role has learning played in affecting who you've become? Have you experienced reinforcement for certain traits or have you been discouraged from being a certain way? In other words, were certain behavioral traits punished and how has that affected you? Think about concepts like classical conditioning, which is a type of associative learning. How has that affected some of your traits and characteristics. We also have the cognitive approach. And so how has your thinking affected who you are? How has that affected your behavior and your preferences? And then we have the humanistic approach. And in this, this approach, there's an emphasis on the self and concepts like self-actualization, a desire to reach our fullest potential, to experience unconditional positive regard from others. And when we do experience that, that unconditional acceptance, we're freer to be who we really are and reach our potential. And then there's the trait approach, which really doesn't ask why are we the way we are? It just simply looks at our traits and characteristics. And then we can make certain predictions based upon those traits. And then we have the psychodynamic approach, which if many of you, as you think about this, this phrase, psychodynamic, you probably think about Freud, 
we're going to be looking at Freud and some other theorists who emphasize the role of early childhood experiences and unconscious impulses or unconscious influences that affect who we are today. So let's start with something probably most of you are very familiar with, and that's the dimension of introversion and extroversion. And when we think about this trait of introversion and extroversion, we can think of it as something that falls on a dimension. Most people aren't extreme extroverts or extreme introverts, although there are certainly some, but many of us fall somewhere on a continuum. And so some of you are leaning towards introverts, some of you are leaning towards extrovert. And so my question to you is, what do you think has contributed to you becoming an introvert or an extrovert? What role has learning played? Do you think that you've always been this way? If you were to ask your caregivers, whoever took care of you when you were a baby, uh, for many of you, for most of you, that's your parents. It might be a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle. What did they say about you when you were a baby? Did you sort of shy away from new situations? And if you did, why is that? What did, why do you think you did that? Is that because you learned to do that? Or was that your biological tendency? We all feel comfortable with a certain level of stimulation, and that certainly plays a role in our preference for being around new people and new situations. And so if you're not very, if you don't, if you're not very comfortable with lots of stimulation going on around you, and that could be loud noises, uh, it could be lots of people talking, lots of things going on, lots of different patterns, colors, whatever it is then you may then just naturally be retreating in situations where there's a lot going on. And so you might feel more comfortable when you're spending time with yourself or just another close friend or a couple of close friends. Whereas for someone who's an extrovert who prefers social experiences and, and, and really likes that stimulation, their nervous system may be very different. We're gonna be looking at what contributes to those things. Why is it that you might be more introverted or extroverted? We know biology can play a role, but what role might these other perspectives say or what role might they um, explain ex uh, contributes to who you are today? So what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to pause this video and I'd like for you to take a look at these items. And I want you to just be honest with yourself and identify whether you think these statements are true or false. And then afterwards, you, you, should ident you should count the number of items that you answered true. And then you'll see at the bottom what this then indicates. Now, this is, this is not a formal assessment of introversion and extroversion. It's just kind of something to get you started thinking about this. So introversion and extroversion, really we can summarize this as how, where are you getting your energy? Are you getting your energy from being around others or do you feel like you need to be by yourself to get re-energized or are you somewhere in the middle? So go ahead and take a moment, pause the video and then identify where are you and how do, what do you think you're like versus what this particular assessment says. A very popular theory of personality and well-known theory of personality is called the big five factor theory of personality. And it's called this because there are identified by this theory, five major factors or traits. And a factor is something that comes from a statistical tool called factor analysis. And factor analysis is where you would take lots of individual, in the case of personality traits, and you can use factor analysis for lots of other things. But in the case of personality, you could take lots of traits, you could take thousands of traits, and then you could use statistics to see which ones are highly correlated with which. And they actually did this and came up with five major factors. And so imagine you could take a thousand different traits or even more, and you could boil them down to five major categories where the descriptions of each of these categories or the traits that are within each of these categories are highly correlated or related to one another. And so you can see here, the first one is extroversion, the one that I just mentioned. The next is neuroticism. Then there's openness to experience, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. Let's take a look at these. So what does it mean to be extroverted? Well, we talked about that just now. 
So a person who's extroverted is more inclined to be gregarious. Uh, and when I say warm here, that does not mean that people who are introverted are not, but because there may be a, uh, a greater tendency to want to retreat in situations where there's a lot going on, it could be perceived that that person is not as, as warm, but they certainly can be and are in situations where there's not so much sensory stimulation going on. Extroverts are more inclined to seek sensory stimulation and therefore more inclined to seek excitement. They are more inclined to have positive emotions. And this has to do with a reduced likelihood to be ruminating or thinking a lot about things. Introversion is associated with having a very rich inner world, but sometimes that rich inner world can be um, with some worries and some, um, you know, overanalyzing is what you may have heard someone say to you if you are introverted. I tend to be more introverted. And so for me, I have, uh, I'm, I feel like I have a very rich inner world. I'm always thinking about things. Uh, be, but because of that, I feel like I might worry more about things. I also tend to want to retreat when there's a lot going on around me so that I can sort of regroup and re-energize. Now, I, I do fine in social situations. I like social situations. But afterwards, I do feel like I need to re-energize. Whereas um, I have a family member who's extroverted and she is energized from being around other people. She doesn't like being by herself. She really wants that sensory stimulation. Introverts can have just as well-developed social skills as extroverts. Social skills are not connected to this trait. It's just what is your preference? And then remember, our personality affects our behaviors. So if my preference is to not have too many things going on around me and to and to sort of have a more calm environment, then I'm going to seek out those, those sorts of environmental characteristics. The next one that I want to point out is neuroticism. And so people who are high in neuroticism, they tend to be uh, more self-conscious. They're more likely to be impulsive. They're more likely to worry and get easily upset. So there's a lot of emotionality tied to this. And remember, these fall on spectrums, just like extroversion and introversion, neuroticism falls on a spectrum. So some of you may be somewhere in the middle. Some of you may be very neurotic. Others may be low in neuroticism. And then we have agreeableness. Some of you may be very agreeable. You just like peace. You like you're very easygoing. I have twin sons. They're seven, just about to turn eight. And they're very different in their personality. They're fraternal twins, so they're not identical. And my son who, um, I have one of my sons who's very much the um, like peace loving person. And he really is very sensitive to the needs of other people. And he um, really thinks about how what he's doing affects others. And um, I also have a four, a three-year-old who's almost four. And he is, you know, he's, he checks on her a lot. He wants to make sure that she has what she needs. And he's just a very loving, kind, um, very sensitive child. And so this is not to say that my other son is not. My other son is also very loving, kind, and very sweet. They're both very um, good kids. But I could see that my one son, the one I told you about just the first one, he is much more agreeable. So in a, um, like when he's playing with his friends, he's really good to just, you know, he just kind of goes along with the flow. He's happy with whatever they're playing and he'll come up with ideas. And if they like it and they do it, that's great. And if they don't and they want to do something else, he's fine with it. So he's easy going. My other son, he really is um, very, um, he's also very thoughtful, very kind. But I can tell you that when he wants to do something, he really wants to, he wants other people to want to do the same thing. So he might be playing with friends and uh, you know, he wants to make sure that his way of playing is also, um, they're also doing that. And sometimes he won't, he doesn't want to play the other, the way that other kids are playing. He wants them to play the way that they are or that he is. And so you can really see this difference. And it's not that one is better than the other. They're just different. And so we can expect different outcomes in terms of, or different behaviors because of those traits. Uh, my my when I think about extroversion and introversion, uh, my my both of my sons 
Well, one of them, the one who's a little less agreeable, he actually is a little bit more introverted, but he has great social skills, but he does sort of need that time to himself. And some of you might be that way. So think about people you know, just like I'm doing, and think about where are they on these spectrums? Where are you? How do you think knowing these traits can be helpful to you? Like I know, for example, my son, who is um, a little bit negatively affected by too many things going on around him, I know that because of that, I need to be thoughtful about that. I don't want him to feel overwhelmed. So I try to help especially when he was younger, but I still do. I try to help him to have transitions that aren't so overwhelming. And if we're going to pre-COVID, if we were going to have friends or family over, I'd let him know in advance because having new people over is a source of stimulation. So little things like that can be helpful when we know people's traits. Uh, and if we know their traits, then we can do those things. Another is conscientiousness. And a person who's high in conscientiousness, and some of you may be falling in this area of being high in conscientiousness, you might be very self-disciplined, you might be very achievement-oriented, you like to do things very well, um, you know, you might, it might take, let's say, a friend of yours who's not that conscientious, maybe half as much time to write a paper as it did you, because you want to make sure everything is just so. Conscientiousness is associated with better health and better grades. Uh, and, and this is, each of these have a biological contribution um, or contributor, but then they also have other contributors as well. We certainly can learn through watching our parents or other caregivers. We can be reinforced for being conscientious. And then we have those biological predispositions. And then we have openness. And again, this falls on a dimension. For some of you, you may love exploring new places and new ideas. You like new types of um, activities. So maybe your friend says, hey, you want to go rock climbing and you've never been before and you find out that you're going to be going on a really um, kind of dangerous and a bit uh, scary, uh, you know, activity. You're and if you're okay with that and you like it, then you're probably pretty open to new experiences. So I have a friend who I went to college with. She was my roommate. And every time I see her on social media, she is rock climbing and she does some pretty amazing uh, rock climbing. Her um, boyfriend, he actually is a, um, he takes people on tours around the world going rock climbing and mountain climbing. That's his profession. So she would, my, my friend, uh, she goes with her boyfriend and he, uh, he really he really enjoys it, and so does she. They're definitely open to new experiences to places like Tibet and have gone to the Himalayas. Uh, I remember seeing um, a picture on Facebook of him having taken his father, who's like 70 years old, to the Himalayan mountains. And so he is really open to new experiences, and so is she. That's very adventurous. Some of you might feel like those will be things you would love to do, to be able to have those new, really almost extreme adventures. And when I say extreme, certainly, um, you know, I mean like physically extreme and mentally too, because when you're going up on these mountains, there's a change in oxygen levels. There's a lot of risk. So all of this has to do with openness to experience. And there's an image in your textbook too that shows you each of these traits. And you can look in your text and you'll see a description of each of these. And again, I'd encourage you to think about where are you on each of these dimensions? And then how does that affect your personality or your behaviors, I should say, and your thinking? What are you looking to seek out? What are you avoiding? Uh, what kind of people do you like to be around? And how might that then be explained by your personality? Do you, um, do, how, you know, if you're very conscientious, do people who are not conscientious uh, bother you at all. In other words, like if you have a roommate who is not conscientious, maybe they don't pick up after themselves. Maybe they leave the dishes in the sink. You might be more inclined to be bothered by that than say someone who's low in conscientiousness. So think about that and where you fall and how it explains your thinking and your behavior. And here are a few items that are from the big five personality factor scale and scale meaning assessment. And these are, that's a, it's a brief scale, the one that I've pulled these from. 
And some of these are reverse scored. So what this means, like, for example, I am easily disturbed, that would be scored, uh, you, you know, you would check that off as true and you give yourself a point for that. Whereas saying something like, I seldom feel blue, obviously that would be reverse scored. And so um, you can look at this and then think to yourself, which of these are most reflective of you? Or go through each of these items and just, you know, and see which of these do you agree with? And the ones that aren't aligned with neuroticism, remember, you need to re you would need to flip those. And so when you develop scales or when scales are developed, oftentimes they will throw items in there that have to be reverse scored. And that that's because um, it helps with, uh, you know, it helps so that the person who's taking that assessment is not, um, you know, it might help with their um, with their honesty and forthrightness. And it also can be helpful so that the person doesn't necessarily know exactly what you're assessing. Because sometimes we do answer questions on a survey or scale in a way that we think other people think we ought to answer them. And actually that's something called social desirability. We'll be looking at that later on this semester, but you know, think about yourself, how many, this is again, I think related to personality. Do you feel like you are very conscientious of what other people think about you? Do you modify your behavior to fit in with other people? Do you want to be presented in a very favorable light? You're very concerned with that, or are you not very concerned with that? And so if you're not that concerned, you're kind of on that end, then you might be less inclined to be answering questions on a scale if they're going to be looked at by someone else in a way that you um, would be, you know, maybe trying to present yourself in a way you think other people would want you to be. And just as a reminder, again, there are, these are dimensions that we fall along. What I wanna point out to you also is that this is actually, the, uh, these scales that are used to measure personality or these traits like the big five factor theory, they're useful in a lot of different situations. They're useful in work settings. Uh, so if someone, if they're looking to decide like a company is to decide who they want to hire, who's the best fit for a job, Certainly, there may be certain personality profiles that they're looking for. It can also be helpful if you're in a workplace and you want to get to know the people you work with better to better understand them. So sometimes it's used in professional development. It also, interestingly, uh, and in a way it's kind of, it's a little bit um, disconcerting, I think, is that there's been a lot of research where big data companies have been able to tie your behavior to these big five factor traits. So your behavior being things like when, you know, think about all the things that are that are um, tracked on your phone. So it could include where you're going, it could include what sites you visit, how long you spend on social media, how much time you spend looking at an image on social media. Uh, what types of searches are you doing? Who do you tend to spend more time communicating with on social media? Where do you spend your money? Because of course, all of this can be connected as they're looking at things like your debit card, your credit card, all of the rewards cards that you use when you go to Kroger, you go to Food City, Walgreens, wherever you're going, all of that data and more is very, very valuable. And there are lots of companies who are collecting this data and they sell it. And it's used for things like um, being able to then target advertisements to you as the consumer and for lots of other purposes. And so it turns out that they've been researchers and in these big companies, they've been able to, based upon your behaviors, come up with personality profiles. So there are certain types of people who um, are, or certain behaviors that people who perhaps say are more neurotic, more conscientious, that tend to be more introverted and not open to experiences and not agreeable. There's certain spending patterns of those people. And if you're an advertiser, it's very effective to target your advertising based upon personality traits because you can make predictions based on those traits. And you can influence behavior based on what you know about that person's traits. So let's say, for example, here's an example. Let's imagine that you are a company that is collecting this data and you are hired by a political campaign. And let's say that 
we know that it used to be years ago that you would get mailers in the mail about different political candidates. And you still do a little bit, but not nearly like you used to. And so now a lot of the advertisements, they are on social media. Even the ones that are on television, you're seeing that frequency decline because that's just like a broad message that doesn't affect everybody in the same way. And it's very, very costly. But messages on social media, they, they can be very targeted based upon your individual traits and characteristics. And so let's say that you are working for a political candidate who is, I'll, I'll just use this example. Let's say it's someone who is a Republican and you want to target voters who you know are, because uh, there is a tendency with Republican voters to be pro second amendment. And so you wanna make sure that you let your potential constituents know you are pro second amendment. You know that that's very important. So what might you do? How might your advertising look different for different people based upon those traits and characteristics? So let's say that you know that you've got a large group of people. Let's say you've got 100,000 people that you're gonna target. It could be a lot more, probably would be, that you know are high in neuroticism and that are also, let's say they are, you know that they are pro second amendment. And then you also have a, um, you also have another group of constituents potentially who are not high in neuroticism. They're actually very, um, you know, conscientious people and they're low in openness to experience. They tend to be, those people tend to be traditional. So your advertisement for your political campaign is going to look very different for those groups of people. The group that is neurotic, your advertisement might look more like a picture of a, um, let's say, let's say you have a picture of a man who's in his home and there is a, there's a potential burglar outside who's going to break in and he's going to protect his family with his gun. So that ad is going to really resonate with that group more than it would resonate with the other one. The other group who maybe is uh, higher, high in conscientiousness and perhaps let's say low in openness to experience, so very traditional, your advertisement as that same candidate with the same values but wanting to appeal emotionally to that person is going to be perhaps a father who is passing his gun on to his son. Perhaps it was the gun that he got from his dad. So there's that tradition. So you can see how this information can be very useful and you can see how it can actually lead to a lot of manipulation. I would encourage you to watch the movie, The Social Dilemma on Netflix if you haven't seen it. I don't know if they bring this big five factor theory into play, but you can see just how much influence social media is trying to have on our behaviors. They ask the question in this film, they say, imagine if you could influence the behavior of the world's population by just 1%. I mean, think about that. You could have a, that's a tremendous amount of influence and social media affects behavior more than that. So it's very interesting. I'd encourage you to watch it. Think about how this data and information is being used. And then there's also, in addition to this, it's, it's good for you to know this. It's interesting. But then we also need to think about some of the um, ethical issues. While we're having all these advances in technology that are happening so rapidly, the laws and the privacy laws, the consumer protection laws, all of those sorts of things, aren't always catching up with the science and with the um, or with and with the data that's being collected, the mass amount of data that is um, that people are collecting, these big companies are collecting collecting for profit for various reasons. And here's an image in your textbook where we have observational learning where the person is not only relying on the environment for shaping their personality. It's also how they actively process that information. So now we're moving a little bit past that be strict behaviorism because we're really looking at the role of cognition. So we could even say this is a social cognitive theory. In this video, we reviewed the basic history of the study of personality and some of the early approaches to identifying personality traits. 
We've also reviewed the behavioral perspective on personality development, and we've looked at the relevance of classical conditioning and operant conditioning. And we've also looked at the social cognitive perspective to understanding personality development. In future videos, I'm going to be reviewing additional perspectives, including the psychodynamic perspective, where we'll look at the psychosexual stages of development. We'll look at defense mechanisms, the id, ego, and superego, and the three levels of consciousness proposed by Freud. We'll also be looking at many more theories or perspectives on personality development.